Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of approving the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Mr. Speaker, the estimates of revenue and expenditure, commonly known as the budget, is the prequel to the discussion on the appropriation bill, in which the Minister for Finance will be outlining the economic, fiscal, financial, social, and environmental policies to be implemented in the fiscal year 2023-2024. Mr. Speaker, the estimates contain the financial plan and work program of the government, and these would inevitably provide for new policies of the government. Mr. Speaker, the budget is the key instrument that the government utilizes to implement its various policies, programs, and projects that show how the government plans to allocate resources to the various ministries or departments to achieve its priorities for the fiscal year 2023, 2024, and beyond. The estimates also show how government intends to finance its programs through the raising of revenues, grants, and loans. Mr. Speaker, it is to be noted that while Parliament is required to approve a budget every fiscal year, many of the programs, policies, and projects will require many years to be fully implemented. Mr. Speaker, while we have separate debates for the estimates of revenue and expenditure and the appropriation bill, the estimates and the appropriation bill are inextricably linked as the former incorporates the policies debated in appropriation bill. Budgets must therefore be viewed within the context of government's longer-term plan to restructure the economy and place it on a longer-term path for sustainable growth and development to benefit the people of the country in a very tangible way through higher standards of living, reduce unemployment and poverty, better health care and educational opportunities, and improve justice and security. Mr. Speaker, our programs, policies, and priorities have been outlined in our manifesto, which was appropriately titled, Putin, You First, as this reflects the philosophy of our party. Mr. Speaker, I note the detractors led by those opposite are attempting to discredit our policies that are anchored in the fundamental philosophy of putting the people first. Mr. Speaker, members who, it must be said, failed miserably in meeting the needs of the people and who were overwhelmingly rejected by the people in the last general election, all of a sudden have solutions to all of the problems of this country. Problems, it must be said, Mr. Speaker, that they either created or exacerbated. Mr. Speaker, our government will not, however, be deterred by those on the opposite side as we are determined to forge ahead to implement our progressive and innovative programs to meet the needs of the people. Mr. Speaker, in fact, notwithstanding this urgent desire of my government to push ahead, the policies of the former UWP government are, unfortunately, among the major constraints that limit our progress. The first and fundamental limitation, Mr. Speaker, is the economy we inherited, and more specifically, the state of the public finances. Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Finance has said on many occasions that we knew the fiscal situation was bad, but never in our imagination did we expect it to be so bad. Mr. Speaker, the former administration 
in the quest to achieve victory in the last general election went on a rampage of reckless, wasteful, and irresponsible expenditures, burdening the citizens and saddling the next generation of St. Lucians with huge debt, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the last administration essentially mortgaged the future of our country, and our government has to now honor these commitments which limit the amount of fiscal space we have to pursue our policies. Can you imagine, Mr. Speaker, that yesterday the member for Schwazel said we are achieving progress because of the progressive policies that they implemented, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, policies that plunge our country into a recession in 2019 prior to COVID. And as a result of the poor health of this economy, we could not have responded effectively with fiscal policy to COVID. Our economy contracted by 24.4% among the highest in the world, Mr. Speaker. Is that what they call good policies? Mr. Speaker, I recall in the 2021 estimates, the debate on the estimates then, I said that when you look at the fiscal dashboard of the country, it was all red. Engine light was on. Every single thing, brake light was on. Every single problem. But they continued to drive the cow state as if everything was just fine. And Mr. Speaker, you know, I was not surprised, but, you know, really disturbed by the leader of the opposition talking about fuel prices and how this government is not compassionate that we are not reducing the fuel prices. Mr. Speaker, I have given careful and sensible treatment to this issue before, but I think on this occasion it is proper that I remind this Honorable House that we have already seen oil prices reach a seven-year high since the invasion of Ukraine. Our government was in office and had to manage the record oil prices at the time. I distinctly recall at the time the leader of the opposition leading a strike because of what he said was the case of a missing consumption tax of over four dollars. And then immediately after winning the election in 2016, saying his job as the Minister for Finance was to sign an SI for the reduction in oil prices when he indeed signed for an increase in fuel prices. He then further increased excise taxes by an additional $1.50 per gallon. The spike in oil prices had caused inflation to increase across the world and has led to an increase in interest rates. Mr. Speaker, we in St. Lucia have no control over these international economic developments. But I am extremely confident that the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party, led by the member for Cassius East and our Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, will manage and cushion the impact on the people and the economy of St. Lucia. Miss Mr. Speaker, I would like to present to honorable members the trend in oil prices over the period 2012 to 2022. The reference for this, Mr. Speaker, is https dash dash www.macrotrends.net slash 1369 slash crude oil price history chart. This can be fact-checked and verified, Mr. Speaker. The trend of oil prices using the average closing price is as follows, and is in U.S. dollars. In 2012, it was $94.05. In 2013, it was $97.98. 2014, $93.17. 2015, it went down to 48.66. In 2016, it went down to 43.29. Now, I want this Honorable House to note that in 2012, it was 94.05. The Labour Party was in office. 
In 2014, again, $97.98. 2014, $93.17. And then when we're approaching the election, it went down to 48.66 in 2015 and 43.29 in 2016. This is what our government, while we were in office, had to deal with. Three successive oil prices rises in excess of US $90 when we were in office, resulting in our government cushioning as much as possible these oil prices increase and setting a target of $2.50 per gallon at the time. In most cases, we were forced to collect less than $2.50 over the period. Now, let us look at the remainder of the period when UWP was in office. In 2017, $50.80. 2018, $65.23. 2019, $56.99. 2020, Mr. Speaker, $39.68. I repeat, $39.68. 2021, $68.17. And 2022, US $96.23. So, Mr. Speaker, what we see is that the SLP reduced the price from $3 per gallon to $2.50 per gallon under the Kenny Anthony administration. And what did the former Prime Minister and Minister for Finance did? While he benefited from low oil prices, he increased the excise tax by $1.50 per gallon to $4 per gallon, which was supposed to have been placed in a lockbox. Mr. Speaker, I believe the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance has such a high and low and cannot find this lockbox. This exposes the hypocrisy of the former Prime Minister and Minister for Finance who could not reduce fuel prices when oil prices were at record lows in 2020. Instead, he chose to give cushy contracts to his FFF. Mr. Speaker, no one could have predicted the Russia-Ukraine war. This was a major unanticipated shock that has had severe consequences for the economy. Under such circumstances, Mr. Speaker, policy making must inevitably be dynamic and must be recalibrated to suit the particular circumstances that the country is confronted with. So, Mr. Speaker, when the, the leader of the opposition comes there masquerading as if he's so concerned about the people of this country, where are the people during COVID that was gasping for air? Whilst the World Bank and the IMF and others gave resources for us to intervene in the lives of the people to give them some income support, that was not done. And I have gone through the estimates, Mr. Speaker, and articulated what the monies were utilized for to continue on the merry way of the FFF empire, Mr. Speaker, whilst people were gasping for air. And all of a sudden, the leader of the opposition comes inside of this house, making people believe that we are insensitive. Mr. Speaker, when we got into office, despite what we found, we reached out to the people of this country and we eased the squeeze. Many social programs were put in place. And in a while, I will show how the Minister for Finance changed the trajectory of this country for the better, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, at almost every parliamentary sitting, the Minister for Finance provides us with an update on the extent of the reckless, fiscal recklessness of the last administration. We need to constantly remind the people of the wasteful excesses of that last administration so that it remains indelibly ingrained in our memories so that we never repeat the errors of the past. Mr. Speaker, based on what happened over the past five years on the UWP, they must never re-emerge from the ashes of time. We all know, and we now know, Mr. Speaker, the money paid for the vaccines, which to date we have not received, the contractual commitment 
with Cayman Health, which our government is now required to honor and for which we had to come to Parliament to seek permission to borrow to meet this commitment. The commitments entered into for design finance construct projects of, the, of DFCs as they are known. I wish to remind St. Lucians that DFCs are entered into when the contractor pays for financing project and the government repays the contractor like a loan over a specified period of time. The former government ent entered into many DFCs as they had no money, a famous phrase used by the leader of the opposition when he was prime minister, and now our government is now required to meet these hefty commitments. And you tell me your policies are creating, you know, some space in the economy and responsible for growth? Mr. Speaker, it is to be noted that many of these projects were improperly procured, resulting in reckless and wasteful expenditure. The member for Cass North has given an account of some of these projects and articulated the scandalous manner in which the roadworks were undertaken in the Rodney Bay area to create what the last administration called a falling highway. This project was executed in a manner, Mr. Speaker, which not only patently violated all project management principles, but also sadly resulted in, sig in significant wasteful expenditure, which most unfortunately the taxpayers has to pay. Orange Grove or the Dyer Mall, we also know of the long-standing commitment the former government made in respect of rental commitments, in respect of millions of dollars for Orange Grove, or what was formerly known as the Dyer Mall. Members need to recall the building was purchased by the former administration and then sold for a fraction of the purchase price with the most ridiculous condition that government was required to rent significant rental space at a ridiculous cost. We cannot forget St. Jude's, Mr. Speaker, in which the last government ignored their own technical audit and went on a frolic of constructing a new building, which remains substantially incomplete at a cost close to $120 million. And Mr. Speaker, we are all aware of the former government's decision to ignore the PPP government, uh, the PPP our government had judiciously pursued with the IFC for the development of HIA and embarked on a totally different course of action, committing our government and the taxpayers by extension to millions of dollars. And the cost overruns on this project has already reached a level which appears to be unprecedented in the history of projects that have been implemented in St. Lucia. So where, where are the policies that created growth and development in the economy? I will stop here, Mr. Speaker, as there are so many other projects in which resources have been wasted. But I think you get the point, Mr. Speaker, of the limitations that our government had to and is continuing to address as it embarks on a policy of fiscal correction, restructuring of the economy, and ensuring that the government gets value for money in undertaking projects using sound project management principles and technical oversight. The external economic environment also significantly influences the ability of our government to pursue the policies we would like to, Mr. Speaker, given that St. Lucia is a small open economy, highly dependent on tourism and imports of goods and services. In this day and age, Mr. Speaker, information is widely available on what is happening in the world economy, and in particular, the significant negative impact that the war between Russia and Ukraine is having on oil and commodity prices and supply chain bottlenecks in the world. Mr. Speaker, while the world was grappling with the impact of the pandemic and began to recover, the external shock of the Russia-Ukraine war exacerbated the underlying conditions in the world, resulting in higher inflation, higher interest rates, and lower global growth. All of these factors, Mr. Speaker, have had significant contagion impacts on the St. Lucia economy, as we now have to grapple with higher inflation, interest rates, and lower growth, 
among our major trading partners. Notwithstanding these strong headwinds, Mr. Speaker, this Minister of Finance, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre and the member for Cassius East has navigated these headwinds expertly, achieving significant economic growth while substantially narrowing the fiscal deficit. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance has indeed delivered a masterclass in economic policy and financial management, as I will show shortly in the review of the budget outturn for fiscal year 2022-2023. Mr. Speaker, before reviewing the budget estimates for fiscal year 2023-2024, it is important for us to account for the performance in fiscal year 2022-2023. In fact, it is a requirement of the Public Finance Management Act. The overall review of the performance of the budget is shown on page Roman numeral 3 the heading of which is captioned budget summary. In this table, there are four columns, namely actual 2021-2022, approved estimates 2022-2023, projected outturn 2022-2023, and budget estimates 2023-2024. We should also recall, Mr. Speaker, that the budget for the fiscal year 2022-2023 was the maiden budget delivered by the Minister of Finance and member for Cassius East. Let me now take you through the fiscal numbers so that you can properly understand the brilliance of the member for Cassius East in managing economic, this economic malaise he had to deal with in the aftermath of the fiscal mess created by the former administration. Revenue collection. It is well known, Mr. Speaker, that there is a positive correlation between economic activity and revenue collections. That is to say, the higher the level of economic activity, the greater revenue collections. A review of the rule, total recurrent revenue shows that revenue collections for fiscal year 2022-2023 is projected to have increased by a whooping 155.7 million over the actuals for fiscal year 2021-2022. Mr. Speaker, while we await the data from the economic review, this is clearly indicative of the faster pace of economic activity. It is also to be noted that projected revenues were higher than the approved estimates for the fiscal year 2022-2020 by 58.7 million. It is also to be noted that this impressive revenue performance was matched by an equally impressive expenditure as the Minister for Finance was able to curb the growth in current expenditure while meeting the legacy of commitments from the former government. Mr. Speaker, compared to the actual performance in fiscal year 2021-2022, current expenditure is projected to have grown by 4.4% to 1.24 billion. But notably, the projected outlook for current expenditure was $100 million or 7.4% below the projected estimates for fiscal year 2023, 2022-2023. As a result of these favorable trends in revenue and expenditure, the current surplus of government moved from a deficit of 140.6 million in fiscal year 2021-2022 to a projected deficit of 40.1 million dollars in fiscal year 2022-2023. An improvement in the overall deficit position by 100 million dollars. This doesn't happen by accident. Mr. Speaker, this is not a, a product of spontaneous combustion. It's not a sudden discovery. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, yes, you would right. 
the current surplus of government moved from a deficit of 140.6 million in fiscal year 2021-2022 to a projected deficit of 40.1 million in fiscal year 2022-2023. An improvement in the overall deficit position, I repeat, by $100 million. Even more importantly, the primary balance, which is the difference between revenue and non-interest expenditure, moved from, and listen to this carefully, Mr. Speaker, from a deficit position of $156.7 million in fiscal year 2021-2022 to a surplus. Yes, a surplus of $29.6 million. We even did considerably better than our own forecast for fiscal year 2022-2023, in which a primary deficit of $220 million was projected. This turnaround in the fiscal fortunes of the country is a reflection of the expert fiscal stewardship of the Minister for Finance. Give Jack his jacket. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, the overall deficit narrowed considerably from $324.4 million in fiscal year 2021-2022 to $150.1 million in fiscal year 2022-2023. As a percentage of GDP, the overall deficit moved from 6.6% in 2021-2022 to 2.7% in 2022-2023. It is to be noted that the prudential benchmark for the overall deficit to GDP is 3%. Having outlined the impressive fiscal performance of the government, Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the estimates for the new financial year 2023-2024. The Minister for Finance has again astutely crafted a budget that provides a platform building on the major achievements in fiscal year 2022-2023 and to meet the priorities of our government and the people of St. Lucia. Recurrent revenue is projected to grow by $204.3 million to $1.4 billion. This forecast, Mr. Speaker, reflects the assumption of continued growth in economic activity that we anticipate in 2023. The budget assumes a nominal growth of GDP of 9.8%, with nominal GDP growing from 5.5 billion to 6.04 billion. These figures are, are bolstered, Mr. Speaker, by the latest business performance survey from the Chamber of Commerce in July of 2022, which revealed that business confidence was on the rise, with 66% of respondents foc forecasting increased turnover over the next 12 months. Grants. The government is also projecting grant receipts of $147 million in fiscal year 2023-2024. This is indeed great news, Mr. Speaker, as the increased forecast for revenue collections provides government with the ability to increase expenditure and allocate more resources to priority agencies to deliver more services and goods to the people of this country while at the same time correcting the fiscal mess that we inherited from the last administration. So let us look at recurrent expenditure. As a result, Mr. Speaker, recurrent expenditure for fiscal year 2023-2024 is budgeted at $1.4 billion, representing an increase of $92.7 million over last year's approved estimates, and more significantly, an increase of $193.1 million over last year's projected expenditure in fiscal year 2022-2023. When we look at the capital expenditure, Mr. Speaker, capital expenditure is budgeted at $302.1 million, reflecting an increase 
of 87.5 million over last year's projected year-end outlook, but 80.5 million below last year's approved budget. I will read this again, Mr. Speaker. Capital expenditure is budgeted at 302.1 million, reflecting an increase of 87.5 million over last year's projected year-end outlook, but 80.5 million below last year's approved budget. These fiscal numbers, Mr. Speaker, show the astuteness of the Minister for Finance in taking the country out of the fiscal abyss that it was placed in under the former administration. Mr. Speaker, the current account deficit, which was narrowed significantly in the last fiscal year by over $100 million, is forecasted to further narrow to $28.9 million. And let's look at the primary balance whilst we at it. Mr. Speaker, the primary balance, which recorded a whooping deficit of $156.6 million in fiscal year 2021-2022, and was miraculously turned around to a surplus of 29.6 million in fiscal year 2022-2023 is further forecasted to strengthen to a primary surplus of 42.5 million dollars. Reflecting the increase in capital expenditure, the overall deficit is expected to increase to 176.4 million compared to the projected outlook for 2022-2023, but is still significantly lower than the 324.4 million recorded in fiscal year 2021-2022. As a percentage of GDP, the overall deficit is 2.9% and remains below the prudential standard of 3%. The net financing requirement, which reflects the borrowing that is required for the budget, is 288.6 million, of which, and significantly, 256.6 million is from external borrowing from multilateral sources at concessionary rates, Mr. Speaker. Brilliant. Brilliant. The allocation of resources to agencies in the draft 2023-2024 estimates of revenue and expenditure builds on the foundation of the estimates for 2022 2023 allocating increased resources in areas of high priority to the government and achieving the objectives we have set in the manifesto. In addition to providing increased resources to agencies to allow them to execute the programs, our government is also working towards increasing the productivity and efficiency of expenditure so that greater value added is achieved per unit dollar of expenditure. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, our government is working towards removing waste and inefficiency caused by poor pro project management practices. But let's look at the sustainability of the budget. Again, let's look at the brilliance of the Minister for Finance. And one of the things you must look at is the sustainability of the budget. And let's examine that now. One of the tests of a good budget is that it should be sustainable and develop within a robust, medium-term fiscal framework. Outlining the projected growth in revenues and expenditure through forward estimates for the next two years, namely 2024, 2025, and 2025, 2026. And in, in the estimates, it has some forward estimates for the two other years. So let's look at how this one relates to 2024-2025 and 2025-2026. The draft estimates of revenue and expenditure provides forward estimates for recurrent revenue and recurrent expenditure and gives a good indication of the movement in these fiscal variables over the three-year period. Namely, and we are going to do it for 2023, 2024, 
2024-2025 and 2025-2026 respectively. So let's look at the current budget year that we're going from 2023 to 2024. For this year's budget, Mr. Speaker, recurrent revenue is estimated at $1.4.13 billion, while recurrent expenditure is estimated at $1.44 billion. This yields a small recurrent deficit of $29 million. This must be placed within the context of the two previous fiscal years, namely 2021-2022, the legacy budget of the former administration and 2022-2023, the first budget of the Minister for Finance. For fiscal year 2021-2022, actual recurrent revenue totaled $1.053 billion, while actual recurrent expenditure amounted to $1.194 billion, and thus yielding a recurrent deficit of $141 million. The corresponding figures for fiscal year 2022-2023 are projections of $1.209 billion and $1.249 billion for recurrent revenue and expenditure, respectively. This yields a smaller recurrent deficit of $40 million compared to the legacy budget of $141 million. So how can your policies have brought any soulagement to the people of this country? This outcome is even more impressive given that we had to meet the back pay commitments of public servants in the year. The source of these figures, Mr. Speaker, is on page Roman numeral three of the draft estimates. So everything I say in this house can be fact-checked. Now let's look at the fiscal year 2024 to 2025, because we're looking at the forward estimates to try to determine the sustainability of the budget. The forward estimate for recurrent revenue in 2024-2025 is $1.408 billion, and the reference page is Roman numeral 5. While the forward estimates for recurrent expenditure for 2024-2025 is $1.234 billion, reference page Roman numeral 8. This yields an overall recurrent surplus. And I repeat, Mr. Speaker, a recurrent surplus of $174 million. For fiscal year 2025-2026, the forward estimates for recurrent revenue and recurrent expenditure are $1.462 billion and $1.231 billion, respectively. As a result, the recurrent surplus, yes, Mr. Speaker, you heard right, the recurrent surplus is 231 million, and even better performance than for fiscal year 2024-2025. It means clearly that the Minister for Finance understands economics and finance and knows full well how to allocate resources and how to ease the squeeze on the people of this country, irrespective of the fact that we have a global political environment which is pregnant with the seeds of our country's continued marginalization. So, Mr. Speaker, the trajectory of performance for the recurrent balance of government is constantly improving, moving from a deficit of 140 million in 2021-2022 to a surplus of 231 million by 2025-2026. This prognosticated remarkable turnaround in performance of 371 million is a reflection of the wizardry of the Minister for Finance in Fiscal Management. In the latest IMF Article 4 Staff Report, St. Lucia, Executive Directors called on the authorities, meaning the government, and I quote, to pursue a credible and growth-friendly fiscal consolidation 
to strengthen fiscal sustainability, create space for social and infrastructure investment, build buffers against natural disasters, and put debt on a downward path. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the fiscal policies of the Minister of Finance is working and the projected surpluses will provide our government with the necessary fiscal space to increase social and infrastructural in investment, which is critical to the continued growth and development of the economy, leading to an overall benefit of the people through increased employment, increased income, and a reduction in poverty. Now that's what you need when you manage the resources of a country coming inherited a fiscal mess. As we were recovering from COVID, in comes the war in Ukraine, driving up inflation, driving up interest rates, and we are able to touch the lives of the ordinary persons in this country as if we're experiencing a boom. And then you all come inside of here, insult the truth of the progress of this government and the Minister for Finance by saying that is not easing the squeeze on the people of this country. Now, you see, Mr. Speaker, I don't mind people coming inside of there and debate, but debate properly. Be truthful. You all have nothing to say, just don't say nothing. Just talk about your constituencies. Say where you need roads. Say where you need water. Say where you need this and that under the various heads. Now come inside of there and try to misrepresent, misrepresent the reality of things here. I want you all to stop that. Honorable member for Shwazel Saltibas, I will pray for you, my, my dear brother. <laughs> I, I, I know you for a very long time. You used to come to parties by, by me on the hill at Martin Luther Street. I mean, we know each other for a long time. Do not allow people to mislead you. Do not become a victim of misleading information. Do not come there and join the fellows. When the fellows do, report sick, my brother. <laughs> articulated, you know, the, the brilliant position that the Minister for Finance has taken. And I'll tell you, what is going on there is not one term. You see that kind of one term thing that existed before? The Minister for Finance has programmed the next decade into his planning. So there, there, there's no tip tick thing going on there. This big things are one. I want to as I prepare to conclude on some of the estimates before I deal with my constituency and my ministry, indicate. I look at the St. Jude's reconstruction um, project, which is very important to us. While each member of parliament will provide details, you know, and have already provided the details in their own way, both in this house and when they leave to go to the various town hall meetings, they will be providing details as to what the budget actually means for the people of this country. I wish to note, Mr. Speaker, citizens, particularly those in the south of the island, will be particularly pleased that an allocation of $32.75 million has been made for the St. Jude's Hospital project. Our government is determined to ensure that this project is completed within the shortest possible time frame so that the people and staff of St. Jude's can be housed in a building worthy of being called a hospital and with provisions, facilities and equipment for proper functioning hospital. Mr. Speaker, the launching of the youth economy, one of the flagship programs of our government, has been greeted with much enthusiasm among the youth, and it is expected that this program will provide significant benefits by providing increased opportunities for the youth through the provision of technical and financial support. I am pleased to note that a provision of $4 million has been allocated to the youth economy. I can list the myriad of projects and programs benefiting from the allocations made in this year's draft estimates of revenue and expenditure. But time will not permit me to do so, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the Ministry of External Affairs, for which I have responsibility. And Mr. Speaker, I have a document there with almost 30 pages. 
at highlighting or just adumbrating, just a shadow of the achievements of the ministry. But again, Mr. Speaker, time will not permit me, even though I am a master in compression, to deliver in any significant time. So what I'll do, a, a, a lot of argument. What I will do is to give a little trailer, and I'm going to articulate in the policy debate the real vibe. So I'm just going through just the first page. The political and economic division, facilitation and advancement of development cooperation with Mexico, resulting in the implementation of four significant projects for the year under review. Facilitation of development cooperation with Japan, resulting in the implementation of two significant projects in the areas of fisheries development and infrastructure. Facilitation of development cooperation with the Republic of China, Taiwan, resulting in the implementation of several projects in diverse area development. Bilateral cooperation with Cuba in the fields of education. Bilateral cooperation with Brazil in the field of health, resulting in the donation of 26,000 vaccines, along with other medical supplies to fight various critical diseases that threaten the lives of our people. Bilateral cooperation with Argentina in the areas of health and human resource development, resulting in the donation of vaccines and the sponsorship of language training for government officials of St. Lucia. Bilateral cooperation with Canada in the provision of technical and financial assistance to St. Lucia for institutional capacity building and for enhancing citizen security, public sector productivity and trade. Launch of a campaign by St. Lucia for the presidency of the Executive Board of United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. The Protocol and Consular Division, the extension of courtesies and privileges, as well as the protection of immunities granted under the Vienna Convention and international law to visiting residents resident dignitaries including ambassadors and heads of state and government. Administration of a differentiated regime of courtesies provided by the laws of St. Lucia to qualify in public and other officials. The upgrading of St. Lucia's diplomatic ties with Alba, Mexico and Venezuela. Heightened engagement by the St. Lucia Consulate in Canada with St. Lucia diaspora and Canada diaspora leaders. And of course, many others across the length and breadth of Canada. Improvements to accountability and service delivery in the issuance of emergency travel documents to members of the St. Lucian diaspora in St. Lucia. Mobilization of assistance from the St. Lucia diaspora in the way of supplies for our hospitals and relief for victims of the trough system which adversely affected the north of St. Lucia recently. For the first time since the pandemic, our people in Canada could have celebrated independence. Logistical and other support provided to St. Lucia students stood in Cuba. Assistance rendered to St. Lucians visiting Cuba for medical and other purposes. A smooth transition by the St. Lucia consulate serving Martinic and French Antilles to the new electronic passport regime. Initiation of a program of transition to a near paperless operation at the St. Lucia Consulate in Martinique. A deepening of bilateral relations with France and the French Department of Martinique in the crucial areas of health and of citizen security as well as border security. So Mr. Speaker, I can go to international trade and civil aviation and diaspora affairs. Heighten efforts at ensuring that nationals in the diaspora are better informed on development initiatives as well as opportunities at home and the contribution, advice and participation sought in decision making. So Mr. Speaker, I could go and list a whole spectrum of interventions. Not to mention Mr. Speaker, that when you have flights coming into St. Lucia and going to this destination and that destination, the engine room is at the Ministry of External Affairs, International Trade, Civil Aviation and Diaspora Affairs. Member for Labrie, you have 10 minutes left.
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to invoke standing order 4210 in order to allow the member for library an additional 30 minutes within which to complete his presentation. Honourable members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the member for library an additional 30 minutes in which to complete his presentation. And now put a question, as many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Members, for allowing me an additional time. And I must say, I will not abuse the patience of this Honorable Lord. I will finish well within the additional 30 minutes that I have requested. But as I was saying, Mr. Speaker, my ministry is the engine room. Normally, we have to engage in some a lot of back and forth and sustained dialogue with the airlines to ensure that documentation, etc., are quite in order to grant fifth freedom rights whenever necessary. It's a very complicated process, but we are getting things going. But when I report in the policy estimates, I will speak about the work being done by the chairman of the Air Transport Licensing Board, Mr. Afan Neptune, and the crew. And they have been doing a fantastic job, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, given my promise not to abuse your patience and to finish well within time, I will at this juncture address matters pertaining to my constituency. I shall speak to my constituents, Mr. Speaker, in the Labry Ogier constituency directly. And I want to begin by thanking them again for making me the instrument of their wishes on the basis of my clear commitment to the pub public welfare. As a Laborian who was cooked and baked in the Laborian culture, was raised among very powerful role models like Watson Louis, Agatha Japanel, the late Hilary Dajeville, the late Rudy John, and many others that shaped the young Alva to be their representative today. <laughs> I, I, will, I will not fall easy prey to provocation. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, let me state categorically that in line with the new prescripts of the new dispensation, and that is this dispensation by the Philip J.P. administration, Mr. Speaker, the appropriate policies that have been put in place to dramatically improve the quality of life of St. Lucians will benefit the people of Labry Oje. Mr. Speaker, every provision made in the estimates, whether it's on the hope or on the pope or on the whatever heading, it will all benefit the constituencies of this country. And Laborians and the people of Oje shall never be left out. In the past fiscal period, every head impacted the people of my constituency. Mr. Speaker, as I have also stated in previous contributions in this Honorable House, I shall pursue the true and real development of the Labry Oje constituency in collaboration with other actors in the drama of development, especially the Labry Development Foundation. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, if the Labry Development Foundation has to function as the central coordinating mechanism in the Labry constituency, there needs to be close support and collaboration. And my office is always open to providing guidance and resources to the foundation to carry out its work. And we are going to cooperate under our respective mandates without infringing, whether directly or indirectly, on the independence and integrity of this organization. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that for many months after the last general elections, I spent a considerable amount of time touring the Labry OJ constituency with relevant government departments, key among which was the Department of Physical Development, following which elaborate plans were produced and a major community consultation was held, followed by another specific engagement with the Labry Development Foundation. 
The central focus of that initial consultation was the Labri Beachfront and Mon Libla development. More specifically, to erect economic infrastructure along the Labri Village Beachfront to continue to stimulate demand for our brand of tourism. We have our own brand of tourism that we are pursuing quietly, especially the Airbnb product, Mr. Speaker. But we are rising without no fuss and without no fanfare. To develop Majomel as the upper library village to further complement our tourism product, not to mention the further development of the Mont Leblanc Lookout Point as a significant tourist attraction. And all of this project shall be explored and pursued in, collabor in consultation and collaboration with the Library Development Foundation. But there's one specific thing that I want to accentuate in this house, that we want to invest all of those projects in the Library Development Foundation to reduce the over-dependence on central government that we can pursue our own development unencumbered by partisan considerations. We are commencing the beachfront development with the construction of the Library Market and Square, which went through community consultations over five years ago under the SLP administration of 2011-2016. In fact, Mr. Speaker, on page 479, head 51, subhead 13, section 11, subsection 2206, section of the estimates of revenue of expenditure 2015-2016, out of a project cost of 2.4 million, 1.3 million were allocated to the construction of the library market. But you know, sometimes there are, there are administrative delays in getting approvals and getting this. It did not happen. Not because the monies were not committed in, in the estimates. In crafting the, the next budget in 2016-2017, an amount of 1.065 million was allocated for the construction of the library market. However, Mr. Speaker, when the former Flambeau administration entered the corridors of power in 2016, it instructed with immediacy that the library market be aborted. However, today under the leadership of the member for Cassius East, as Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the library market is back in the estimates to commence construction this year. As <laughs> As a matter of fact, last year, last year the Minister for Finance committed $1 million on the head 47, subhead 001, line 0399, for the construction of the library market. However, due to, again, administrative delays, we did not commence the reconstruction of the library market in the fiscal year 2022-2023. However, we held a public meeting to discuss the square before it's finally implemented. And so, Mr. Speaker, on page 594 of this year's estimates of revenue and expenditure on the head 47, $2.5 million have been allocated for the erection of the library market. And Mr. Speaker, I have no lingering doubts that the library market shall commence during fiscal year 2023-2024. And I'll tell you, it's going to be a great celebration when we have the sign-in ceremony at the library market. You'll be coming to the New Orleans yes. of St. Lucia. You know, I hear people talking about the, the cultural capital. The library is saying anything. Grosile say that they're the cultural capital. Well, we see they have Tambu, they the cultural capital. We have jazz in library, we have our own brand. So we are not competing, we are complementing our colleague. Yes, sir. So we no fuss, no fanfare. But certainly it will be a great day when we arrive at the signing ceremony. <laughs> During this fiscal year, we will upgrade the Desmond Colima Park. And this is this is the, the ambition, and I follow from the presentation of the Minister for Youth, and Youth Development and Sports. And I'm very pleased 
that he has interest in the Labri constituency. He has been on all my playing fields, and there will be some intervention on the, on the crossover park as well as the OJ playing ground, Mr. Speaker. This project will certainly impact positively in the constituency and will excite young people that for a very long time they have not seen such a development. And part of the upgrade will include lighting of the OJ playing ground. We shall continue working on the designs for the Bans and Laguas multipurpose facilities. We have already begun work on the Majomel waterfall and conceptualization of the Upper Labri village at Majomel. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with continuous engagement with those I represent, we began a new round of community meetings prior to this debate. We held two such meetings, one at Majomel and one at Black Bay. After this debate on the estimates, we will continue our engagement. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to a vexing issue for the constituents of the Labri Oje constituent, and that is roads. Roads, Mr. Speaker. Roads, a vexing issue. I can state categorically, without any fear of contradiction, that our roads, there's no other constituency that have that, that has experienced such neglect. And Mr. Speaker, the neglect was because of a vindictive and oppressive UWP administration. Successive Flavo administrations neglected, neglected my constituency to the extent that even Rhodes Labour actually rehabilitated would fall into disrepair. So the entire road network would be a problem. However, I am pleased to report to this Honorable House that whilst we have not engaged in any massive roadworks in the library constituency, laborians can now drive on roads that are certainly more motorable. Immediately after the elections, we were able to bring relief on the Majomel Road and the Kate Road. And today, as we speak, because of the intervention of the Minister for Infrastructure, and of course, the man who holds the public purse, the Majomel Road is under construction. And no more will you hear me come in here and talk about even donkeys, right? Donkeys went on strike going up to Majomel. The Cartier Road, when I was in opposition, I went on the Cartier Road and for four kilometers of road put base material to bring some relief to the people of Cartier. But as you know, it rained heavily last year and has washed away. Now, the Prime Minister has said to this honorable house and he has said to ministers, don't look for trouble with him about the roads. He has to manage the economy. We have to move into some consolidation. And therefore, I am saying to the people of Library, we need to be obedient to those instructions because we have to put the economy back on track to be able to deal with the roads. So, we should not see any massive roadworks. But we just did some potholing on the Debois Road. We did some potholing on the Wavin Pont Catin Road. And I believe such interventions would hold until we are ready to rebuild the roads. What I would require for Auger in particular is a help throughout this fiscal period to continue building sidewalks. I have built two sets of sidewalks in the, in the OJ con community. Because school children and the elderly have nowhere else to walk. They have to walk on the road. So during this fiscal year, we need to build sidewalks in Palm, going down to Black Bay, going up to, to the Cate area, where those young children have to walk long distances to go to the OJ Combined School, and at Debois, and along the main road. So we are going to start there. So at least when we commence road rehabilitation, 
they will have somewhere for them to walk outside of the road. Further, when we finish with St. Jude's, an emergency vehicles would be speeding on the Black Bay, Palm Oje Road. I want my people to be safe. And so, I ask of you, Minister and Prime Minister, to assist me with that. But there's one road that I want some attention to, and that is the Carter Road. The Carter Road, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Carter Road. I, Mr. Minister and Mr. Prime Minister, we have to fix up the Carter Road. And then we'll hold tight until the time comes for us to rehabilitate the entire road network. So do all, put all your heavy equipment on the road, go and build St. Jude's. And I said last time that the only way St. Jude's would not be completed, completed well within this term is if the world end before our term ends. Magadi San Kweol and Long Mamanu. Come and stick to your category. Selman here. L'hôpital Saint Jude's pas est fini. C'est si la fin du monde fait avant. We are going to complete the hospital. And we are going to continue to fight to equip the hospital properly. Because it's not just a building. We have to continue. And through my ministry, we would like to see at least an MRI machine emerging somewhere in this country. To to stop our people swimming to Matnik for MRI, or going to Barbados and Trinidad and other places, yeah. you know? And in my last trip, I have spoken to a friendly government to see if we can source an MRI machine and a CT scan, so that at least the people can enjoy better facilities, better diagnostic tools to improve the overall quality of healthcare in this country. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to Head 56, the Constituency Development um, Project, CDP, which contains an allocation of 21 million. Mr. Speaker, whilst this figure represents one-tenth of what is required for what I would like to undertake in the Labri Oje constituency, I, I am willing to share that amount with my parliamentary <laughs> colleagues, <laughs> because it is in giving that we receive. Therefore, I am expecting to receive some significant support from this allocation to assist my constituency to catch up with matters of infrastructural development. When the UWP government, which you belong to, the former government, there were many persons who had the contracts to build roads in the constituency, in Oje, in Pom, Upper Oje, Black Bay, at Béwanger, Labri Village, wow. you know, <laughs> all parts of the constituency. You had in excess of 20 persons who were affected, and Flabo came in and stopped all the contracts, disregarded them. Now we are back. They would like to proceed with the project. And therefore, I would need special dispensation to engage in this catching up process. So, Mr. Speaker, I am very optimistic that I will get the support and cooperation of the, the, the Minister, and of course, the Minister for Finance. I am pleased to say that despite the fact that I did not get any additional support, I have built two of those roads that were outstanding under the CDP allocation. Also, Mr. Speaker, our schools, my four primary schools in the constituency, with the exception of the Labry Girls that was built during the former Kenny Anthony administration between 2011 and 2016, we rehabilitated the girls' school. But Labry Boys, Oje Combine, and the Bans Laguas Combined School, all in a deplorable condition. To date, I have responded to the request of the principals and have extended significant support, hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
to help them respond to critical needs because the school plant is very important for learning. If the environment is, is not conducive, it will impact learning. In the same way that if people are not healthy, it will impact learning. And a, and a, and a great thinker once said, if you are not well enough to learn, you are not going to learn well enough. And I believe that we need to ensure that we have a clean and wholesome environment for our children to actually learn. Now, I provided the library boys as well as OJ combined with some support. But the Bus Lagua School, the building which houses the principal staff and a couple classrooms, that's a headquarters for termites. <laughs> When I go to the school, those termites are so troublesome, Mr. Speaker, as if I have to negotiate with them for me to pass, like they are doing border control. So I said I'm going to be back after the estimates and be coming with my friends from this parliament to ensure that we deal with them. So, Mr. Speaker, I think during this fiscal year, Despite the fact that we are going to continue to be prudent, to put the economy back on track, and to deal with the external environment, we are going to deliver some significant uh, benefits to the people of the country, including the schools that I have articulated. And I'm sure that the Kate people will see the construction of that road, the Kate road. So, Mr. Speaker, despite the hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of infrastructure and touching the lives of the people. I want to say that for me, the greatest achievement for the past fiscal year for me was the manner in which I reach out and intervene in the lives of the ordinary people. The voices that we do not hear very often. You know, poor people have a lot of pride, Mr. Speaker. And when they come to you, they expect you to be confidential about their affairs. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been expended in helping people with health, with education, and other social interventions. And Mr. Speaker, going around I saw the faces of mothers where the faces were stained with the acidic tears of hurt under the United Workers Party. For five torrid years, they couldn't take care of the kids. Some of the kids couldn't go to school. Some of the houses were in darkness because they couldn't pay this and they couldn't pay, especially in the, in the period immediately after the 2021 elections, immediately after. And they came quietly, and I responded to them. And when I see them today, Mr. Speaker, they are doing much better on the Labour Party administration. Through the various allocations of this government, as well as my own efforts to mobilize resources to help them, they are doing much better. And this is why the Star of Freedom had to emerge in this country on the 26th of July, 2021. And like I said a few moments ago, for the sake of this country, for the sake of the people of St. Lucia, the United Workers' Party with that type of approach must never re-emerge from the ashes of time. They must never re-emerge from the ashes of defeat. We talk about Singapore, Mr. Speaker, making great strides and doing very well, the same size as St. Lucia. And then St. Singapore is doing so well and St. Lucia is not doing well. If we continue to change government every five years and as if it's on the job training that's going on there, or one term this and one term that, we are not going to achieve policies that will reach maturity and give birth to the type of results in the country. Had the Labour Party remained 
from 1997 until now. I would not be having any conversation about Carter Road. I would not be having a conversation about any Marjomel Road. I, will not, I would not be having a conversation about the schools in my constituency. It is because every time the United Workers Party gets into office, there is a break in purpose. They disrupt, they disrupt in a very real way the development agenda and they do as they please. And then we have to fight to regain our country. This time with the Minister for Finance, based on his performance, you all have to wait a very, very long time to re-emerge in any significant way as even a strong opposition. I encourage the opposition, Mr. Speaker, to join with the government as we try to deal with the pressing but legitimate needs of the people of this country. Let us not split the development of St. Lucia at its political scene. There is a need to come to Parliament. There is nothing wrong in debating the cost of government, to debate its policies, to debate the budget, to debate when we are amending laws or we want to pass new legislation. There is no problem with that. There is no problem. You will not be tortured for honest purpose. I have said before and I'll say again, let our deliberations in this house be a survey of contending views and ideas, not the type of propaganda that, that I'm hearing coming from the other side and trying to, to inflame the passions of the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, I stand firm with the Minister for Finance. I stand firm with my colleagues as together we chat a real cost for this country and take this country to a new level. And because I said that budgets are not just for a five-year period but long-term development plans, we would require to plan beyond the next elections so that we can continue to take the people of this country to a new place. The structural changes that would be required shall be done, Mr. Speaker, so that we as a people can move forward together. So I end, Mr. Speaker, by indicating that the central focus of the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance is the stabilization of the macroeconomy on the very trying circumstances and putting well-being at the center of public policies and moving towards stronger social protection systems. Because inclusive and sustainable growth requires a stable ec economic framework and sound management of public finances. Mr. Speaker, given that the budgets must be viewed within the context of government's longer-term plan to restructure the economy and place it on the longer-term path for sustainable growth and development to benefit the people of this country in a very tangible way. So I am confident that there will be practical realization of many projects that will uplift the people of this country. Long live the member for Cassius East. Long live the Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Long live the Minister of Finance. May God continue to bless his hand as he signs many things for Labry to get what it rightly deserves. And of, and of course, and what is left, he can share it with my colleague. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.